Well, thank you very, very much. Um, I, I am thrilled to have the chance to be introduced at someone fixing to get killed at the Alamo. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you, two year, three years ago, when we started campaigning for the Senate, I went all over the state of Texas saying, if elected to the U.S. Senate, I hope to be a senator like Phil Graham. All over this state, that was something I said over and over and over again. So everything I've done wrong this past year, you can blame on Phil. And, you know, he mentioned that fight in 1993 over Hillary Care. You know, I remember when Hillary Care was first proposed. You had Democrats who were feeling ascendant. They just won a big election. They were convinced they were going to pass this thing. And if you think back and remember in 1993, the reaction of an awful lot of Republicans in Washington was they came out with, with, with what I called at the time Hillary Care Light. They said, we'll partially socialize health care. That's our proud Republican position. I remember I was in law school at the time. I just about put my boot through the television set. I was so ticked off. I said, all right, to heck with all of you guys. None of you believe anything. I'm going to go move to an island and fish the rest of my life. And then... The great senator from Texas, Phil Graham, strode out to the microphones. And, you know, it's, it's one of the things that drives my staff crazy is any time I endeavor to do impressions. <laughs> now, good impressions are pretty good, but actually bad impressions are better. <laughs> but in 1993, my senator, Phil Graham, stood up there and said, this will pass over, over my cold, dead political body. <laughs> and then I'm pretty sure he started to read Green Eggs and Ham. <laughs> <laughs> and there were a whole lot of Republican senators who were in the back, kind of hiding behind the curtain, and they sort of looked over. And he hadn't been killed. And they all ran over behind him and said, yeah, yeah, what he said. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm convinced if Phil Graham hadn't been in the United States Senate, Obamacare would have been passed 21 years ago and it would have been called Hillary Care. That's the power of leadership. And I am proud to try to carry a small portion of the leadership that you provided for this state and hopefully to, 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 to carry on the endeavor that everyone here, that TPPF is engaged in, that everyone here is engaged in, that our leaders in Texas and the state legislature are engaged in, which is telling the story of freedom. That's a powerful, powerful thing. Telling the truth matters a lot. What I want to talk with you guys briefly about is an area of the truth that the news media doesn't talk about a whole lot. I know that's really hard to believe. <laughs> Anything the media won't talk, I, I know it's really hard to believe. I want to talk to you about rule of law. You know, one of the great things about TPPF is it focuses on first principles. It focuses on the principles that matter that have made this country free and great and it created an environment where anyone can start with nothing and achieve the American dream. But if you look at most of the history of mankind, rule of law has been honored in the breach, if at all. Most of the history of mankind has been a history of tyrants and despots, power concentrated in one place. Sometimes they'd give rights to the people. But if government has given you its rights, it can take away those rights. And the framers of our Constitution created a political miracle in this country. 
when they divided power among the branches of government between the federal government and the state government, and they en enshrined rule of law in our governing documents and in our history and culture. There are many, many disturbing things that have happened under the Obama administration. Texas football's gone to pot. <laughs> there are lots of bad things that have happened. All right, it's probably not fair to blame that one on the president, but we can anyway. But of all of the bad things that have happened, I think one of the most dangerous is the consistent pattern of lawlessness from this president and this administration. You know, three years ago, the course of the immigration battles, President Obama said he supported the DREAM Act. Okay, we can support the DREAM Act. That's a position. You can go advocate for it. People asked him at the time, three years ago, well, do you have the authority to just do this on your own? His answer was, no, 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 I don't have the constitutional authority to do that. And then six months before the last election, suddenly the authority materialized. Now, set aside what you think of the merits of that decision. Is it a good decision? Is it a bad decision? And just think for a minute. You have the President of the United States who goes out and announces, we have immigration laws, they're on the books. I'm going to ignore them. I am, with the stroke of a pen, granting amnesty to some 800,000 people. I'm not changing the laws. I'm simply saying I'm the President, therefore amnesty is granted. That's remarkable. Let's take drug policy. A whole lot of folks now are talking about legalizing pot. The brownies you had this morning were <laughs> provided by the state of Colorado. <laughs> and you can make arguments on that issue. You can make reasonable arguments on that issue. The president earlier this, this past year announced the Department of Justice is going to stop prosecuting certain drug crimes. Didn't change the law, didn't go, you know, that's an issue. You could go to Congress, you could get a conversation, you could get Democrats and Republicans who'd say, we ought to change our drug policy in some way. And you could have a real conversation, you could have hearings, you could look at the problem, you could discuss common sense changes that maybe should happen or shouldn't happen. This president didn't do that. He just said, the laws say one thing. And mind you, these are criminal laws. These are laws that say if you do X, Y, and Z, you will go to prison. The president announced, no, you won't. Those words on that law book thing on your shelf, pay no attention to those. And let's take Obamacare. Please, take Obamacare. <laughs> Obamacare has single-handedly been an illustration in lawlessness at a breathtaking scale. Obamacare, the statute. The president is a big fan of saying it's the law of the land. We need to follow the law of the land. Oh, really? Let's see. That law of the land says on January 1st, 2014, the employer mandate shall kick in for big business. Now, unless my iPhone is broken, I think we passed January 1st, 2014. And yet the president just announced unilaterally, no, we're not enforcing that. I'm granting an exemption to all of big business. And by the way, this was done. Was this done through a big formal announcement, through a, an address to the American people, there's a problem in this law, we're going to have to change it. No, it was done through a blog posting by a mid-level bureaucrat at the Department of Treasury on July 3rd, right before the 4th of July break. Just said, by the way, this portion of the law is no longer operative. Now, 25 years of our nation's history, it used to be if you want to change a law, you go to Congress and say, okay, hey, this law isn't working, let's change it. 
Apparently, all of that was a mistake. Apparently, instead, you can just get a mid-level bureaucrat to put up a blog posting and say this portion of the law doesn't matter. So, what is the law in the United States of America? If you go and think it's actually what's written in the United States Code, the United States Code says big business has to comply January 1st, 2014. And the president simply says, no, it doesn't. I'm granting them an exemption. When do they have to comply? Well, right now we think it's 2015. Because he said it's a year exemption. Of course, we've been here an hour. That may have changed. <laughs> Let's take another example. Congress. Now, I know no one here could ever imagine that members of Congress want different rules to apply to them than anyone else. That's really pretty out there. One of the provisions of Obamacare in the text of the statute is that members of Congress will be on the exchanges without subsidies, just like millions of Americans. Congress wrote it in there because they said, look, if we're going to create this pile of stuff, that's a euphemism, <laughs> then we ought to at least eat those stuff burgers along with everybody else. Now, what happened? Well, Harry Reid, Senate Democrats, had a meeting in the Capitol. They invited the president down. It was a closed-door meeting, but they apparently said to the president, they said, we don't want to live under Obamacare. This thing's bad. <laughs> Holy cow! Nancy Pelosi said we had to pass it to find out what's in it. We found out it's bad. <laughs> And so the president said, don't worry, I got your back. And he legally granted an exemption for every member of Congress. Just Ted put out a statement, said, oh, no, no, that little provision that says you've got to be on the, on the exchanges without subsidies, that, by the way, you and your staff are freaking out about. Few things are funnier than watching Democratic congressional staff members who wrote this nonsense in utter abject pain. What do you mean? I, I'm going to be thrown on these exchanges and not have some... I, I might... I, what, what if I can't see my own doctor? Those are real... I'm not making those up. And you're just like, oh, really? Is that a slight inconvenience to you? <laughs> or you take the most spectacular of the consequences of Obamacare that have happened so far. And it's not contrary to the media depiction, the abysmal website. Although that was a rather amazing display of incompetence. Over five million Americans have lost their health insurance because of Obamacare. You know, one of the things I try to remember every day is, is, is I've got 26 million bosses. I work for each of you. I try to come back to this state every weekend, if possible, travel the state. Everywhere you go, you hear from men and women in the state who say, I I've lost my health insurance. I I've got a child with diabetes. I'm scared. People are hurting because of this. Now, we all know the president promised, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. Question mark? period. Now, the New York Times said he, quote, misspoke. <laughs> you know, there comes a point with the left-wing media where, where you can't even make fun of them anymore. You just simply say what they said. He misspoke exactly the same way 27 times on camera to the national <laughs> population. So what did he do in response to that? We all now know that the statement, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it, was a flat-out, deliberate misspeaking. <laughs> it 
We all know that the statement, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor, was a flat-out deliberate misspeaking. It was kind of a stuff burger. And what did he do? You know, if you were a student of history and you saw some big government program that wasn't working, the usual way you do is you go to Congress and say, hey, we got to fix this. Let's do something to fix it. You know, if, the, if there were, one of my colleagues observed to me about a year ago that she was not a sixth grader. If you were to ask a group of sixth graders, what do you do if the law isn't working? They'd say, oh, you go to Congress and the House and the Senate, they pass a bill, it goes to the president, he signs it, that's how you change the law. What did the president do? He held a press conference where he stood up and said, and, and, and let me just, I'm going to take a quick digression. Why did five plus million people lose their health insurance? Because Obamacare made their health insurance illegal. That wasn't an unintended side effect. The text of the law says, that policy you think you like, we don't like it, it's illegal. So the president holds a press conference and he says, insurance companies, I am instructing you now, go issue the policies that we just made illegal. I am directing you as president of the United States, go violate the law. Now, a formalist might say, I remember first year criminal law, that's aiding and abetting. <laughs> Instructing someone on how to violate, technically it's not a felony, so it's not, but for the reporters in the room, just to clarify that. Because <laughs> that'll get blown into ridiculous proportion. He simply held a press conference in which he instruct, per, instructed private citizens, disregard the law for one year. And then next year, follow the law, unless I change it, <laughs> or not. And amazingly, at the same time, Congress was trying to pass legislation to address the fact that 5 million plus people lost their health insurance. Simultaneously with giving the speech, the president said, and I will veto any legislation that does what I'm saying. Look, there is a level at which all of this is ludicrous. But there's another level at which all of this is incredibly dangerous and terrifying. And there have been Republican presidents in the past who abused their power. Shockingly, I know no one here could believe that's possible. But the difference is when that happened, you had Republicans who stood up and said this is wrong. When Richard Nixon tried to use the IRS to target his political enemies, you had bipartisan condemnation. This is wrong. By the way, Nixon tried to do so, didn't succeed. When the Obama administration tried and succeeded in doing so. The Democrats all did their obligatory for one day. I am outraged. Now please go back to doing what you were doing before. Whether or not you agree with the substantive policy decision, whether it's on immigration, whether it's on uh, drug policy, whether it's on Obamacare, if a, the President of the United States can simply pick and choose which laws to follow, can say, I will follow this law, I won't follow that law. This law, I will follow section A, B, and C. I'm going to skip D, and I'm going to follow E, 2, and 3, but not 1 and 4. 
we know what that looks like. There are countries on this globe where that is how the law works. You look at corrupt countries where rule of law is meaningless, where dictators are in power, and they have things they call law. But what, what does law mean? Law isn't the dictate from government. Every country has dictates from government. And yet not every country has rule of law. Rule of law is the notion that we are a nation of laws and not of men. And that no one, and especially, especially, especially those in political office, are not above the law. If we have a system where the president can pick and choose what laws to follow, at utter whim and discretion, then the whole rest of our constitutional structure becomes superfluous. That's dangerous. That is seriously dangerous. Many of y'all remember a few years ago when George W. Bush was president. Many of y'all remember the case Medellin versus Texas, where in that case, President Bush, unfortunately a good man, made a mistake and signed an order that tried to order the state courts to obey the world court. It was wrong. It was unconstitutional. And I'll tell you, I'm proud of the state of Texas, that Texas stood up to the president who was a Republican, who was the former governor of our state, went before the U.S. Supreme Court and said, no president can give away U.S. sovereignty. No president can undermine the rule of law in this country. And the Supreme Court, by a vote of six to three, struck down the president's order and upheld U.S. sovereignty and rule of law. Let me ask y'all a question. Where are the Democrats? Where are the, is there no Democrat in Washington who actually believes in rule of law? I got to tell you, if it were a Republican president, if it were President Phil Graham, or even better, President Wendy Graham, Well, for one thing, this wouldn't be happening. But if it did, there'd be Republicans lining up to defend the rule of law. And where's the media? Well, they're in the back. But where are they actually reporting on what is going on? If you care about liberty, an imperial president who defies his constitutional obligation to, quote, take care that the laws be faithfully executed is an extraordinary threat to the liberty of this country. And I'm going to close by speaking to liberals and Democrats. This may not be the best place to do that. <laughs> I mean, it, it is the People's Republic of Travis County. <laughs> but I'm gonna close by speaking to liberals and Democrats. Maybe, just maybe, you say, yeah, I'm a little troubled by too much presidential power a little troubled by the government monitoring everything we say. By the way, for, for those of y'all who have cell phones, please leave them on. I want to make sure the president hears everything we say. <laughs> if you're a liberal, if you're a Democrat, if you're a reporter for the New York Times, Maybe you're saying, look, he's my guy, I root for my guy. I don't like a few of the things he's doing, but he's basically a good guy, so it's okay. You know, I'm reminded of, going back to Medellin, when the president signed that order telling the state courts to obey the world court, I got a call from the U.S. Solicitor General, a, a good friend of mine, Paul Clement, a very, very good man. 
who called me and he said, Ted, are you sitting down? That's not a good way to begin a conversation. So he, he described to me what, what the president had just done. And he said, but hey, the good news is the president keeps his finger on the trigger. He decides when to use this new power to set aside state laws. And so you, you should be very comforted by that. And my response, I said, well, Paul, A, that's not much comfort given how it's tried to be used right here and now. But B, Paul, there came a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph and his children. Amen. This president, even if he's, he's my guy, ain't going to be there forever. And if this president has that power, so does the next one and the next one and the next one. And my message to all the Democrats, to all the liberals, what do you think about the next president? Maybe a Republican having the power Barack Obama is claiming to have. A president who is not bound by the law is no longer a president. And if you love liberty, that should concern you greatly. Amen. Thank you.